Gaude amus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. There's a lot to be said for a short homily, and a lot can be said in a short homily. Short homilies, in fact, are pretty much all we have from Peter Chrysologus. They're almost all we know with certainty about him. He preached them on principle, he said so himself, and he rarely strayed beyond his customary 15 minutes. But based entirely on his corpus of short homilies, he is revered today as a father of the church, as a saint, and as a doctor of the church. He's even called the doctor of homilies. Born in Imola, Italy, in the last years of the 4th century, Peter was a disciple of the bishop there, whose name was Cornelius. Cornelius baptized, educated him, and ordained him a deacon. We know nothing about his accomplishments in those years, but he must have made an impression in the church in Italy, because around the year 426, the Pope in Rome chose Peter of Imola for a very important assignment. He named him as Bishop of the city of Ravenna. Ravenna had long been an important city for commerce. Though it was situated inland, it had ready access to the Adriatic Sea by way of a sophisticated system of canals. This also afforded easy access to important cities of the Eastern Roman Empire. As the 4th century turned to the 5th, the Emperor Honorius was looking for a new administrative capital for the western half of the empire. Rome had long since been abandoned for Milan, but Milan was increasingly vulnerable as barbarian tribes closed in from the north. Canvassing all his options in the Italian peninsula, he settled on Ravenna. The city was surrounded by vast acreage of swamps and marshes, which effectively served as a defensive moat. Any army that attempted an approach would soon find itself bogged and at least delayed. The city had already prospered from its natural defenses. In the year 402, the Emperor Honorius had declared Ravenna the new administrative capital of the Western Empire and there he had moved the court and all its treasure. At the end of the 4th century, its population hovered around 50,000. Now, as a capital, it would experience a full flourishing of culture. With the emperor came the court, and with the court came an abundance of treasure. Ravenna now became the destination for the Western Empire's best and brightest, in rhetoric, in sciences, and in the arts. For a brief moment, then, Ravenna shone as a beacon of Christian culture, and that moment coincided almost exactly with the years Peter Chrysologus was bishop and then archbishop of the city. The monumental buildings still stand as proof, as do the rich mosaics inside, and of course, Peter's short sermons are still read profitably some sixteen centuries after his death. But first a word about his name. In his lifetime, he was Peter of Imola. Not till the ninth century is there evidence of the nickname Chrysologus. It appears in a biography that is larded with legend by an abbot named Andrew Agnellus, who tells us that Peter received the title from the regent empress after he preached his inaugural homily in the city. She declared him to be Peter of the Golden Words. Peter Chrysologus. What is more likely is that the West wanted its own golden preacher, since the East had St. John Chrysostom, whose name means golden mouth. So Peter posthumously received the title and the legend to go with it. It's true, however, that Peter arrived in Ravenna eagerly awaited by the empress and the court, and his first task was to preach to them. The heir to the imperial throne at the time was Valentinian III but he was just a little boy. So his mother ruled in his place, 
and she was one of the great figures in Roman politics in her generation. Gala Placidia was her name. She was the daughter of Theodosius the Great. In childhood, she was precociously intelligent, charming, and beautiful. At an early age, she was welcome at her father's court in Milan. In 410, when Rome fell to the Visigoths, Placidia was kidnapped and taken to Gaul, where she was married to the barbarian ruler Atolf. After Atolf was assassinated, Placidia returned to Roman territory, where she was pressured into marriage with the Emperor Constantius III. And with him, in their brief marriage before his death, she conceived the child Valentinian. In both marriages, Placidia was respected and called upon for her wisdom and counsel. Having grown up at court, the daughter of a brilliant strategist, she knew a bit about governance. Once installed in Ravenna as regent for her son, she maintained a good relationship with the eastern emperor, who arranged for his daughter to be Valentinian's eventual bride. Today we know Gala Placidia from our history books. We know her from her face in Ravenna's many beautiful mosaics. And we know that she was a great patron of the man we know as Peter Chrysologus. He preached to her on his opening day and he preached to her on many Sundays and holy days afterward. They became famous as co-workers, building the churches that have made Ravenna a tourist destination. But they also competed with one another in acts of piety. A contemporary historian in Gaul describes their figurative tug-of-war over the relics of a recently deceased holy man. In the end, Gala Placidia kept the saint's body for the empire, and Peter received his clothing and hair shirt for the church. Placidia and Peter shared several basic religious principles. They held to Nicene Orthodoxy as it was confirmed and developed at the Council of Constantinople and later at Ephesus. And they were fiercely and traditionally Roman in their sense of papal authority. In fact, the only letter of Peter's that has survived is his response to an appeal he had received from the heretic Eutychus. He refuses to make judgment, because he insists that the word of Pope Leo the Great must be the final word. He tells Eutychus, In the interests of peace and of the faith, we cannot make a judicial inquiry into matters pertaining to the faith without the approval of the Bishop of Rome. My advice is that you obediently heed what the most blessed Pope of the city of Rome has written, because the Apostle Peter, who lives and presides over that sea, does not refuse to teach the truth to those who seek it. That letter survives because a copy somehow made its way to Rome and was filed away with Pope Leo's correspondence. Otherwise, what we know of Peter's golden words are his sermons. We have about 179 that bear his name, though a few of those are certainly spurious. They're all easily available in three volumes in the Catholic University of America's Fathers of the Church series. The originals were apparently recorded by a stenographer while Peter preached, because they record his many digressions and asides and even faithfully reflect his shifts in verb tense. Even with digressions, however, They never run long. Occasionally, Peter even ends his sermon abruptly, explaining that it is his custom not to weary his congregations. But it's hard to imagine how anyone would grow weary of Peter's preaching. His preaching reveals a thorough familiarity with the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New, and he drew from both abundantly. He always begins from a passage or episode of Scripture, most often from the Gospels and he then proceeds to explain its historical sense before concluding with its religious meaning, which for Peter was usually moral and practical. Like many of the ancients, he was fond of allegory, though he never pursues it to the point of tedium. In one of his sermons, he explains, The historical narrative should always be raised to a higher meaning, and mysteries of the future should become known through figures of the present. Therefore, we should now unfold by allegorical discourse what symbolic teaching is contained beneath the outward appearance. He goes on, then, 
to interpret the gospel story about Jesus' cure of the woman with the hemorrhage, while on the way to cure the synagogue official's daughter. For Peter, the daughter was a real historical person, but she also served God's plan as a symbol of the synagogue. While Christ was hastening to save her, he allegorically represented his mission to the children of Israel. But while he hurried by, the Gentile nations, which were suffering a hemorrhage, came to him surreptitiously. In all his preaching, Peter shows a tender love for the people in the Gospels, most especially the Virgin Mary. Here is just one example. He who is not awestruck by this virgin spirit and who does not admire her soul is ignorant of how great God is. Heaven trembles. Angels quake. Creation cannot bear it. Nature is helpless. Yet a girl carries God in her womb. She receives him into herself and offers him a dwelling place. Okay, here's another. This one's on the Annunciation. Truly blessed is she who was greater than heaven, stronger than the earth, wider than the world, for she alone contained God, whom the world does not contain. She carried him who carries the world. She gave birth to her creator. She nourished the one who nourishes all living things. Peter's words still sing, even in translation even across a civilizational gulf of a millennium and a half. They're rich in poetry, they're rich in theology, and yet they're accessible to ordinary Christians. Because those common folk of Ravenna were his intended audience, not only or not primarily the court. He wanted all Christians to grow in virtue and avoid sin. He urged them to come to church to confess any sins they had committed. He warned them away from the superstitions that were common in his time, horoscopes and palm reading and other forms of fortune-telling. He begged them to stop joining the pagans in the raucous celebrations of the old Roman feasts. Over the course of his sermons, he also makes a lively response to the heresies of his time, all of which must have made their presence known in the capital city. He shows special concern for Arianism, because it was the religion of many of the barbarian mercenaries in the Roman military. But he also saw lingering effects of Nestorianism, which had only recently been condemned by the Council of Ephesus. In short, he was concerned about the matters that really concerned his people, and he treated them with clarity, concision, and brevity. But for Peter, the greatest of these was brevity. While Peter was bishop, Ravenna was elevated to a metropolitan see, and so he became an archbishop. He may be the only church father you can see today in a portrait produced during his lifetime. It's in Ravenna's Church of St. John the Evangelist, which Gala Placidia built in thanksgiving after she had had a brush with death at sea. There, in the apse, is a mosaic depicting Peter as he offers Mass on a ship. So perhaps he shared that perilous voyage. He has white hair, a long beard, and wide eyes. His friend Gala Placidia is standing there with him. In 450, Peter undertook a journey to his hometown of Imola. We don't know why, but we know he died there. Gala Placidia died that same year. It would not take long for Ravenna to fall, and with it the Western Empire. That happened in 476, when the barbarian Odoacer took the city and the throne. He deposed the pathetic 11-year-old emperor, and afterward refused the Roman purple mantle as worthless. I hope you enjoyed this episode, as I hope you enjoy every episode of The Way of the Fathers. If you did, I'd like to ask you a favor please consider making a donation to keep us going in the year ahead. Catholic Culture is a non-commercial, not-for-profit organization completely dependent on your support. It's been around in one form or another for 25 years, making it one of the oldest and longest-running Catholic Internet apostolates. Maybe you've been meaning to help us out, but you haven't gotten around to it yet. 
Well, there's a good reason to do it now, as your gift will be matched. A generous donor has agreed to match every dollar we raise up to $105,000. We'd love it if you become a sustaining member. That's the easiest way to support our work. Many who do start out at just $5 a month. It's quick and easy to set up. Remember, we pray for our benefactors every day. Dequorum solemnitate Gaudentangeli Et collaudant filium Dei Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture podcast.